Welcome again, my friend. Sit, take a drink, and listen to the tale of the Imp Tree. Once there was a king of Winchester called Orpheo, and dearly he loved his queen, Herodis. She happened one hot afternoon in summertime to be walking in the orchard when she became very drowsy, and she lay down under an imp tree, and there she fell fast asleep. Now, the imp tree is not, as you might suppose, a tree of the imps, but a tree on which a branch of another tree has been imped or grafted. While she slept, she had a strange dream. She dreamt that two fair knights came to her side and bade her come quickly with them to speak to their lord and king. But she answered them right boldly that she neither dared nor cared to go with them. So the two knights went away, but very quickly they returned, bringing their king with them, and a thousand knights in his train, and many beauteous ladies dressed in pure white riding on snow-white steeds. The king had a crown on his head, not of silver or red gold, but all of precious stones that shone like the sun. By his side was led a lady's white palfrey that seemed to be prepared for some rider, for its saddle was empty. He commanded that Herodis should be placed upon the white steed, and thereupon the king of fairy and his train of knights and white dames, and Herodis beside him, rode off through the fair country with many flowery meads, fields, forests and pleasant waters, westered castles and towers amid the green trees. Fairest of all, on a green terrace overlooking many orchards and rose gardens, stood the fairy king's palace. When he had shown these things to Herodis, he brought her back safe to the imp tree, but he bade her on pain of death meet him under the same tree on the morrow. When Herodis awoke from this dream, it was to find Orpheo standing at her side. She told him of all that had happened, of the fairy king and of the green fairy country she had visited. He resolved that on the morrow he and a thousand knights should stand armed around the imp tree to protect her from the fairy king. And when the time came, there they stood like a ring of living steel or a hedge of spears to guard Herodis. But in spite of all, she was snatched away under their very eyes, and in vain were all their efforts to see which way she and her fairy captors were gone. Orpheo made search for his lost queen everywhere during many days, but no footstep of her was to be found in upper earth. And then, in sorrow for her and in utter despair, he left his palace at Winchester, gave up his throne, and went into the wilderness carrying only a harp for companion. With its tunes as he sang to it, sorrowing for Herodis, the wild beasts were enchanted, and often came around him, yea, wolf and fox, bear and little squirrel, to hear him play. And there, in the forest, Orpheo, as the old storybook says, often in hot undertides would see the fairy king besides, the king of fairy with his rout, hunt and ride all round about, with calls and elfin horns at blue, and hounds that did reply thereto, but never pulled down heart or doe, and never arrow left the bow. As an aside, in case you don't know, an undertide is an old word for an afternoon. And so he passed the time. And sometimes he saw the fairy host pass, as if to war, the knights with their swords drawn, stout and fierce of face, and their banners flying. Other times he saw the fairy knights and ladies dance, dressed like geysers with tables beating and joyous trumpets blowing. And one day Orpheo saw sixty lovely ladies ride out to the riverside for falconry, each with her falcon on her bare hand, and in the very midst of them, oh wonder, rode his lost queen, Herodis. He determined at once to follow them, and after flying their falcons, they return through the forest at evening to a wild, rocky place, where they ride into a rock through a rude cleft overhung with brambles. They ride in a league and more until they come to the fairest country ever seen, where it is high midsummer and broad sunlight. In its midst stands a palace of a hundred towers, with walls of crystal and windows coped and arched with gold. 
All that land was light because when the night should have come, the precious stones in the palace walls gave out a light as bright as noonday. Into this palace hall Orpheo entered in the train of the ladies, and saw there the king of fairy on his throne. The king was enraged at first when he saw the strange man enter with his harp, but Orpheo offered to play upon it, and Herodias, when she hears, is filled with longing, while the fairy king is so enchanted that he promises to Orpheo any gift he likes to ask out of all the riches of the fairy regions. But Orpheo to this only has one word to reply. Herodias. And the king of fairy thereupon gives her back to Orpheo, and they return in great joy, hand in hand together through the wilderness to Winchester, where they live and reign together for ever afterwards in peace and happiness. But let none who would not be carried away like Herodias to the fairy king's country dare to sleep in the undertide beneath the imp tree. And so ends the tale of the imp tree. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Thank you for your company my friend, and I hope to sit with you again very soon.